We're delighted to have um, Oriana um, Chigwin, um, who's going to be presenting today. I think, as Dave already mentioned, she's one of our winter incubator participants. Um, she's a graduate student, staff scientist in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, she worked during the winter incubator um, with e-science research scientist Nicoletta Cristia, um, who's also a research scientist in the Civil and Environmental Engineering um, Department associated with the Freshwater Initiative. Um, so Oriana, I'll let you take it from here. Great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, yeah, as uh, I already said before, um, my internet's not great, so I'm gonna say goodbye to you all visually, but I'm still very much gonna be here. Uh, audio, yeah, audio. Um, if something does start to like hang up or something, um, uh, may somehow notify me, because I, I could picture also just me like continuing on a path and not hearing anyone. So anyway, so uh, I'm gonna um, stop my video and share some beautiful things with you. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, I was in, I was an incubator fellow in um, the winter and it was a really great program. Um, I worked with Nicoletta Christia um, on a project looking at how climate change is going to affect multinational rivers. Um, so I'm gonna give like kind of an overview of some of our findings from that study, um, but hopefully along the way, I'll also give you a flavor of the kinds of tools that we used. Um, uh, yeah, so we actually in the Pacific Northwest um, have a multinational river in our very backyard. So here's a little watercolor of the, the Columbia River at Vantage. If you've ever driven across I-90 in Eastern Washington, that's like the line across the blue water right there is the um, the bridge across the Columbia River and that water um, actually came at one point from Canada. Um, so the Columbia River, um, it's something that I've spent a long time studying. Um, I'm finishing up my PhD right now, I'm defending um, in a few weeks and the bulk of my research has been about the Columbia and how it's gonna change under climate change. And one of the big takeaways I had from it was that um, there's, so, so two countries um, are, are in the Columbia River, Canada and the US, and they work together on managing the river going into the future. Um, and one of the big things that causes issues between these two countries is the idea of maybe climate change will impact them differently. Maybe um, things will uh, like cause more water in one part, one country's part of the, the river basin than the other part, country's part of the river basin. Um, and this is potential, um, causes a potential for, for conflict within a river basin. So, um, this kind of inspired me just to start wanting to think about how climate change is going to affect multinational rivers around the globe, um, which is a pretty big project to, uh, to bite off, but I'll show you kind of some, some things that I've started to do um, with the help of Nicoletta um, and, and what I did in the past, past couple months. So I'm a hydrologist. I think about the water cycle. Uh, that means kind of how um, water evaporates from the oceans and from, from the landscape, goes into the, into the sky and then comes out as precipitation um, and, and flows through rivers. And the way that we as humans really interact with water is through, through water that we get from rivers or from wells or um, from reservoirs. And we, we need that water to kind of, it, for any number of reasons. Um, but when we think about um, uh, this water, it, like we, we all need it, but it doesn't really care about national borders. So a river would cross a national border and, um, and if maybe water comes from one side of, of, a, na uh, of a national border and goes through to another side of it, um, it doesn't care. So what I wanted to know is, okay, under climate change, um, what might happen to upstream countries versus downstream countries? 
because this is very relevant for rivers around the globe if you've heard um, about the Nile River, there's lots of dams going up in Ethiopia, um, and there's, it's, there's this potential for conflict uh, among countries within a single river basin because it becomes an issue of, of national well-being, national security, things like that. Um, just to kind of drive home the point a little further, perhaps you remember um, this fabulous movie from I think it was 2008, Quantum of Solace. Um, I believe perhaps Roger Moore said that it was a quote, disappointment of a movie, but nevertheless, I remember <laughs> seeing it at the time and thinking um, that it, it brought up a really interesting point. So they, um, they talk about the idea of water crises um, happening in the future due to, to water availability. Um, and they're specifically talking about an aquifer in Bolivia in this movie, but um, it ends up being like water is something that we all need. Um, and it ends up being really an, an issue that, that, that is irrespective of national borders. Um, so in this case, I am going to be James Bond. Um, and I'm asking the question, will climate change exacerbate water availability in international river basins? Um, instead of his kind of various explosive uh, tools, I will be using things like Pangeo, uh, Geopandas, X-ray, DASC, um, and Raster.io. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm doing all of this within the lens of climate change. Um, as like a two second primer on how we as climate scientists think about climate change and model it, um, there's kind of two pieces. So one um, is that we don't know how much carbon we're gonna emit. And the cause, the real, the cause of all of these changes in climate is the idea of emissions. Um, and there's various ways that climate scientists can, can um, think about our, our emissions um, and, and simulate it. Uh, for the purposes of what I'm going to show you today, I'm showing a scenario um, in which we, we emit a lot of carbon. So on the y-axis here, um, I'm showing, or this is a, a report from the International Panel on Climate Change, um, but uh, this is, is carbon dioxide emissions plotted from 1960 through 2100. And so, and I'm in the simulations that I'm showing follow the purple, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, the high purple trace here, which is kind of a, you can think of it as a business as usual scenario in which our, our global growth and emissions really just continues as is. Um, and so, what climate scientists do is they come up with these different the, these scenarios of potential emissions for the future um, that have to do with kind of global expansion and industrialization. Um, and they take those emissions and they put them into climate models. And these are really um, complicated computer models that take uh, this, this boundary condition of certain kinds of uh, levels of emissions. And then they, they let the earth kind of um, simulate what it, how it would respond to those emissions. Um, and this is done in a, re, uh, a really huge coordinated effort from the International Panel on Climate Change as part of a coupled model intercomparison project. Um, it's called CMIP. Um, for this study, I'm using results from CMIP 6, which was re released about three or four months ago, finally. Um, uh, fi but I mean, I just, <laughs> they, they started to be released a few months ago and I've started using them. Um, it's a very large data archive. Uh, and one of the things that's great about um, being able to work in an environment like eScience is that you're, uh, um, I was able to, to get access to a lot of really smart people um, and, and uh, active members of, of the scientific communi um, computing community. Um, for instance, folks working on the Pangeo project. Uh, and they were really able to, to offer me the resources to engage with these very large data sets um, using kind of uh, great tools. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can simulate the Earth. Um, this project ends up being, uh, it shows results from all, all these different modeling 
projects around the world, um, all these different global climate models they're called. And it ends up being a really large data archive. So what I'm going to show you is an analysis of projected changes in water availability around the world. Um, but it, both in the medi like median change in, in water availability, but also within this ensemble space of, of there being multiple global climate models. The way I'm going to talk about it is um, using two metrics. One is just annual runoff. This means that like how much water over the course of a year would leave your landscape and go into a river. The other metric I'm going to use is hydrologic range. The idea of this is um, how variable the amount of water leaving your landscape is. So you could picture um, if, so in the Pacific Northwest, uh, perhaps you are familiar with, um, if you were to go hiking and you'd think about a river, um, it's probably pretty wet in the winter um, uh, when there's like lots of rain or maybe there's snow melt or something, but then it's really dry in the summer. And so that would have a higher hydrologic range than, for instance, a, um, a river that's in a very stable climate where nothing really changes. Um, and these two things are really important in terms of us understanding how much water there is because on the left, annual runoff is something that decides just how much water is going to be present in the landscape. Um, on the right, hydrologic range tells you, okay, if things are really variable, um, maybe a lot of that water will come, there will be a lot of water, but it'll come through in a really strong pulse and you'll never actually be able to capture it and use it for all of your different needs, um, like agriculture, or, um, or drinking water. So the, the vi like it's not just the mean amount of water that is important, but it's really kind of how variable it is. Okay, so this is, I'm gonna show some results from some of these analyses that we did, which was using these like very large um, earth science data sets. So overall, the world is wettest near the equator. Um, what I'm showing here is this is looking at the, the analyses from CMIP-6, this like large earth science data archive, but averaging the runoff, so the amount of water in all of these different basins around the world. So all of these different polygons shown here um, are a different basin. You can see the Mississippi that's outlined right here, you can, um, and it's kind of like a pale green color. Um, you can see down here is the Amazon. And I, I hope my cursor is visible, but if not, you can, Look for where the Amazon is in, in South America, it's the bluer color, because there's a lot of water that falls around the equator. And um, this is largely just due to, the, to precipitation patterns in the Earth. Um, there's also a lot of water that falls in, in Indonesia. The, the basins actually, they kind of blend in with the plot, um, just because they're really dark blue. There's a lot of water that comes off of rivers like that. Um, so moving into the future, um, now what I'm going to show you is results from these global climate change experiments. Um, so moving into the future, uh, we can calculate what the percentage change um, in that amount of water is. Um, and overall, our basins are going to get a little bit wetter. Um, but there are some that, that will get drier, notably the Amazon here. Um, and, and kind of search other, other basins in the mid-latitudes around here. Um, the other way that we can look at it is thinking about this hydrologic range. So like how dynamic are our basins? And one big takeaway that I have from this is that going into the future, these high Arctic rivers are gonna get much less variable. Beca the red colors indicate that it becomes less variable. That's because we're losing a snowmelt peak. So if there's any earth science people in the audience, um, you're like in a snowmelt driven basin where there's lots of um, the precipitation falls as snow and then it melts in the, when it gets warm in the spring or summer. Um, that can be a defining characteristic of, of a river. In the future, uh, that signal will get dampened just because you have less snow. Um, and it kind of melts um, in a more uh, even pattern. Um, but as I said, there's lots of different ways to simulate the Earth. Um, and so really the uh, plots that I was showing before are just a, a representation of, um, 
the median change. But really, we have a whole distribution of changes. And so here, instead of having these basins on a map, instead I'm plotting them on as a, a little scatter plot. And so on the x-axis, uh, it's called the runoff ratio. All it means is that it's kind of how much of your water that fall, falls as rain or precipitation on a basin actually makes it into a river and out to sea. Um, and so like generally your more tropical wetter rivers are towards the right. You have your Irrawaddy, um, the Ganges Brahmaputra, these are in Southeast Asia, um, versus uh, more, more arid basins would be on the left. Um, and the color of these plots indicates the average temperature. So you have your Arctic rivers are these blue ones at the bottom um, versus your tropical ones, which are these lighter yellow colors at the top. And the general pattern I see is that um, on the y-axis, it's the change in hydrologic range. So this change in how dynamic a river basin, a river is. And your colder rivers, are they're the ones that are decreasing um, in their variability by the end of the century. Um, but your, your warmer rivers are actually increasing in variability. And that has to do with larger um, precipitation um, variability. But like I said, what I really want to get to is this idea of international, um, international basins. And so how are these differences between different, um, within a basin, uh, different uh, between downstream and upstream countries? And so in order to do that, um, I kind of created this way of, of um, thinking about these disparate differences uh, within a basin. Um, uh, I wanted to acknowledge also Andrew Bennett for, for brainstorming and coding support on this. Um, he was really great, and I know he's in the room, or, or in this virtual room. <laughs> so um, I'm now going to show you some so these analyses in which uh, what I did was I took um, every up the an upstream every portion of a basin divided it up according to diff the national borders within that basin, and then asked the question: Okay, in a global climate, in each of these global climate model simulations, within each of these different national uh, portions of a basin, is the mean annual runoff increasing or decreasing? and compare it to every other nation that it's connected to in that river network. So in the case of the Columbia River, for instance, we have Canada, which is upstream of the US. Um, I would ask, okay, is annual runoff increasing in Canada? Is it decreasing in Canada? Is it increasing or decreasing in the US? And then depending on what that relationship is, um, you can put a little tick box in this matrix shown here. Um, and depending on where you put a tick uh, in like where it lands in this matrix, it tells you how that relationship between the two countries could um, be managed or, or pose conflict or, or pose an opportunity for collaboration within the basin. Um, for instance, if both upstream and downstream countries are both decreasing in, in their overall amount of water available, there's kind of no question that there's going to be some scarcity there because we're losing water availability. However, um, if an upstream country is increasing um, in their amount of water and a downstream country is decreasing, perhaps gravity could help that sharing because water flows downhill and that gravity then maybe could help transfer the water that's in excess upstream to downstream countries. So I'm just going to show you a handful of these. Um, but for all of these river basins, uh, I went through and looked at all of the different connections between these different nations uh, in a river basin, um, and then all of these, the, this ensemble of, of, uh, of global climate model simulations. And in the Amazon, what we see, for instance, um, we, in, in the aggregate, the Amazon was decreasing its water availability. Um, but it's just interesting to highlight the fact that for in the, um, the dominant indicator is that both downstream and upstream countries are going to be decreasing in their water availability. But there are some simulations that show that some upstream countries will actually be fine, um, whereas Brazil, the downstream country, will still be decreasing. 
Um, an interesting thing to highlight in the Zambezi, which is in kind of southeastern Africa, um, there's an actual, a pretty strong indication that upstream countries will be decreasing in the amount of water they have available, whereas downstream countries are going to be staying roughly the same. Uh, this poses a, uh, a challenge just because gravity can't help you there. If an upstream country is losing water, the fact that a downstream country might be okay isn't going to actually help it. And so this is a way of thinking about um, changes in water availability through more of a geopolitical framework. Um, this is repeating the same idea, but instead for this hydrologic range, so how dynamic is a river. Um, overall, the rivers um, that I'm highlighted here are largely that things will be increasing in their variability. This poses a challenge because um, more, the more variable a system is, the more stress it can put on a water management system. Um, and the more potential there is for losses of water from a river simply because of flooding. And it's just, our systems can't capture that water and use it for, um, for agriculture or, or consumption. So some final takeaways, climate change is likely going to alter water availability. Um, we'll have more water, but there will be more highs and lows um, in terms of floods and droughts. Uh, it's critical to assess disparate differences within multinational basins. Um, it's important to understand that uh, when there's changes within a basin, uh, they might be felt differently depending on, on what country is, is in it. Okay. Uh, all of this code was put up on, on GitHub. You can find the repo there. Um, uh, and I just want to acknowledge some support. Uh, the East Science Institute, they were really great. Uh, the I would highly recommend the incubator program. Um, the Pangeo community was also really um, wonderful there. Uh, yeah, Andrew, and then um, all of these great open source packages. Uh, and yeah, I'd be happy to contact me. Um, that'll be really fun to talk. Uh, yeah, and I'd be happy to take questions. Awesome, thank you, Ariana. Um, so we'll do questions like we normally do. Um, if you raise your hand with under the participants icon, I'll see you in the list and then we can call on you in, in order. Um, I have a question just to start things off. What are the units of hydrologic range? If, when you were showing us, you know, like minus three to plus three, because um, at first I was like, I put it in my head as like inches and then I thought millimeters and I'm just curious what, what those numbers refer to. So it's unitless. Um... So, okay. yeah, so the idea being that it's, um, it's literally just taking the, uh, the min versus the max and dividing it by the total. Um, I see. Yeah, as a way of kind of like if, if all of your, your runoff came in one month, it would have a range of one. Um, if there was no difference among any of the months, it would be zero. So it's, it's, yeah, I understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's relatively normalized. I mean, you show those numbers, it really is apples to apples. Uh, yeah, exactly. Which is why, um, and like I specifically um, designed it that way. Uh, like I kind of, mm -hmm. actually Nicoletta and I talked about all sorts of different ways of thinking about this. Um, Cause like you don't, like the standard deviation wouldn't really work. Because it it could it would um, it would kind of draw your attention to certain situations more. The coefficient of mm -hmm. variation would also not really work because it would, yeah. So I think this is a nice way of kind of normalizing for for all of like a wet basin and a dry basin would kind of um, it would work equally well. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Oriana? Okay, um, Diana, I see has a question. Hi, um, great talk. Uh, not being a, a person who thinks about water a lot, um, I was wondering what are the time scales for these kind of um, effects where, you know, you had that matrix of, you know, upstream, downstream, decrease stays the same, increase. And in some of the cases, it was like, you know, there would be scarcity downstream or scarcity upstream. And I was wondering what are the, like, time scales that these effects would become exacerbated? Yeah, I think um, it's a really 
great question. And also, I guess I want to draw, I want to emphasize that the things that I'm looking at are, um, wouldn't be useful for management or decision making purposes. I think it really is a research tool um, to more um, highlight like we need to look in these like hot spots of potential issues. Um, in terms of the time scales, um, so what I was looking at was projections for the end of the century. So these would be um, like end of century being uh, 70 years from now. Um, at that point, they would have our projections are that they would have um, a marked difference in the amount of water available. Um, I'm specific in terms of like the time scales of this like variability. I'm spe I'm looking at um, within like intra annual, so so monthly variations in in water available. Um, that matters because like water managers. So like if you um, uh, if you have a reservoir where you you keep water to to use for irrigation later in the year, um, that they care about uh, what happens from month to month. Um, so so that like monthly time scale matters. Um, there are some people who have uh, enormous dams that can hold water from year to year, and so then they might not care about that intraannual. Um, variability as much. Um, yeah, so, so I guess those time scales matter. But like, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think we'll, um, I actually have a quick question and then we can transition to our speaker. Um, I wanted to ask if you had any particular insights about our basin um, that came out of doing this work. Yeah, so um, it's actually kind of the reverse. So I spent, I've spent like five years looking at the Columbia River and in like very high detail in, the, in terms of like conducting a study that um, is a model for what I would recommend elsewhere based upon these analyses. So like in, oh my God, there's someone like drag racing. Um, <laughs> so there's, um, so like my, the analyses that I found um, show like the Columbia does light up as a hotspot. Um, and so it's great that that study was already done in, in finer detail. <laughs> um, but I would recommend, I mean, I'd recommend that uh, definitely the Zambezi and then these, um, the rivers in, the, in Southeast Asia like receive higher scrutiny and it's happening um, for sure. Uh, but I think it's, it's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it in terms of this like more hydropolitical framework. Uh, let's see, actually we have, we have one more question. Let's try and um, Francisco, if you wanna quickly pipe in, I don't wanna, I, I'd like to get the opportunity to get your question and then we'll take that as the last question actually and then we'll move on. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Ariana, for your presentation. I was hoping, um, well, I guess my question, given the time we have available, is a little bit limited. Uh, I, so just for context, I'm in the policy school, and I can't help but wonder how um, the policy decisions being made right now might affect downstream construction and infrastructure rates, um, which could then affect, you know, um, just how the water flows downstream. For example, if there's not good practices on dam inspections, then you have increased failure rates, which could affect downstream water availability for other countries. and. Um, so that's just where I went to with, with all of this uh, analysis. And, and I'd happy to take this conversation offline or via email uh, if you're willing to engage me further. Yeah, I, I'm happy to engage anyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think like, I mean, definitely my, it's great to hear that you're in, in the policy space. Um, I think it's, uh, I feel like it's really important for scientists to engage in um, I, I really enjoy uh, engaging in work that is, is um, relevant to policy and relevant to kind of informing the, the greater world. Um, and I, my hope would be that like that this study itself wouldn't inform policy, but rather that it would inspire um, more detailed research that would then um, 
make it into a, into a policy space. Because uh, I think like, um, the, like if we can avoid water scarcity through kind of um, a concerted effort of, of collaboration, I think that could make a lot of people around the world have a um, improved quality of life. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Oriana, and, and yeah. hopefully you guys can connect offline. Um, and any other folks who want to reach out to Oriana, um, you're welcome to reach out to either myself or Dave if you need contact information. Um, great. Thank you very much. Thanks.